Thank you very much, Gloria. And wow, what a turnout. <laughs> I thought by now everybody would be so sick of Trump. <laughs> you wouldn't want to come and hear yet another peroration on the, on the subject. Well, this, I hope, will not be a peroration. It's, uh, uh, I'm, I have a point of view, and that will become obvious as I speak, but I am making a real effort not to be shrill. <laughs> and uh, I hope I'll succeed. You'll let me know at the end, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so many of you were here a week ago for the great debate, uh, which was enormously entertaining, and I hope you enjoyed it. And it's just, I think, um, uh, symbolic of how uh, creative and, um, uh, and imaginative uh, Gmail has become in its programming. Uh, I'm just a great fan, uh, as the programs have improved just year after year. And uh, I think we're just so lucky in this community or in the Northshire to, to have this resource available to us. OK, um, about a year ago when I stood here, I've been reminded um, that I said, never Trump. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't going to happen. And I have been reminded so many times since <laughs> of that. And I can only say in my own defense that I had a lot of company. Um, very few imagined uh, the remarkable trajectory that took him first to the Republican nomination and ultimately to the White House. Um, it is um, what, whatever else may, one may think of, of Trump, a remarkable achievement by a single human being to have done what he did almost by himself, uh, without a political party behind him, without much organization, uh, quite, a, quite an astounding accomplishment. So on Thursday, two days hence, uh, it'll be exactly six months since Donald Trump was elected. Um, given how unexpected his election was and how unusual his candidacy was, uh, I proposed this talk to Gmail um, right after the election because I thought it would be interesting six months in to reflect on what kind of a president he was turning out to be. And that's what I hope I'll be able to accomplish by the end of the 30 or 40 minutes that I'll be speaking. I've struggled to find the right way to frame this presentation, the right way into this subject, uh, and also the discussion that uh, I know will follow. And there's such a swirl of media attention and public discussion about this president that it's really hard to decide where to begin. We could talk about his undeniable unwillingness or inability to distinguish fact from fiction. We could talk about his focus, his, his obsession with Twitter. Uh, we could examine his attacks on the media and the media response. We could talk about his unique approach to ethical conduct in office. <laughs> or we could look at public policy and his, his approach to public policy. And I've decided to take the latter course. I've decided that there's very little I could offer about Trump's behavior that hasn't already been reported. I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze him. Uh, it's, this has been done in excruciating detail in the media and the, both the press and TV. Uh, cable TV ratings are at an all-time high. Newspaper readership has spiked, uh, particularly online, um, in, in, uh, uh, over the last six months. I know that Americans are paying attention. And because of that, I'd like to focus on what his administration has tried to accomplish and how much progress it has made in these first six months. Beyond all the noise surrounding Trump's unusual behavior, what is his administration actually doing? Well, let me talk first about Trump as the titular leader of the Republican Party and begin with his cabinet appointments and what they may signify. In foreign affairs, apart from the false start with Mike Flynn uh, and all that we know about that, um, 
The cabinet uh, on the foreign affairs side is a combination of military and business focus with the appointment, I think, of competent men in Mattis, in McMaster, and in Tillerson. This is a traditional mainstream Republican uh, foreign policy uh, group. Um, there's perhaps a somewhat stronger deference to the professional military than we are accustomed to seeing. But considering some of Trump's campaign rhetoric, I think it's fairly reassuring, at least to me. And I'm referring in the rhetoric to his China baiting, uh, to his Putin worship, and to his strong anti-NATO attitude, among other things. On the economic front, it's also strongly pro-business, with Mnuchin, Wilbur Ross, Gary Cohn, uh, strong business people, um, there are practically no economists, actually, uh, in the cabinet, any, any with formal economic training. And interestingly, there are practically no lawyers in this cabinet, which is unusual. But the appointment of Steve Bannon signaled a deeply conservative orientation that foretold the selection of a militantly anti-regulatory group, which includes Scott Pruitt at EPA, Tom Price at Health and Human Services, Ryan Zinke in Interior, Jeff Sessions as Attorney General, Betsy DeVos at Education, Alex Acosta at Labor, and Mick Mulvaney as the head of the Office of Management and Budget. As Bannon so colorfully put it, these appointments appear to be designed to, uh, quote, deconstruct the administrative state. In his inaugural address, largely written by Bannon, Trump clearly foretold much of what was to follow, an America first policy that would entail, among other things, withdrawal from existing international agreements, removal of regulatory constraints on American business, scrapping of environmental regulations that Trump deemed to be economically detrimental, and major investments in the military and in the nation's infrastructure. What was less obvious was the extent to which Trump's agenda, as it has emerged, has seemed to be more motivated by a desire to destroy his predecessor's legacy than any positive program of his own. More than any president in memory, Trump's approach to the presidency seems less about pursuing a positive vision than about dismantling the present structure of economic and social institutions that have grown up over the past half century or so. Deconstruction of the administrative state turns out to look very much like yet another attempt on the part of the right wing to roll back the New Deal. In this, I believe he has been guided less by his own worldview uh, than by the ideology of the now deeply conservative Republican Party. Joe Scarborough, you all know him as Morning Joe, this week in a, an op-ed in, in the Washington Post called this political movement, quote, he calls it a political movement, quote, reduced to an amalgam of talk radio resentments, which seemed to me to be an interesting way to characterize the Steve Bannon worldview as uh, articulated largely by Donald Trump. Trump has often seemed to be at odds with Republican orthodoxy during the campaign. But since in office, he has hewed very tightly to the right-wing platform of the party at which he is at least titular leader. Some examples, uh, and these are familiar to all of you, the, the repeal and replacement of Obamacare, of, of the Affordable Care Act, his proposed budget, which among other things slashes social programs, imposing the global gag rule and pressing to defund Planned Parenthood, withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, approving the Keystone XL pipeline, scrapping Obama's clean power plan, and nominating a deeply conservative Supreme Court justice are among a few uh, of, the, uh, of the bits of evidence of what I regard as a hard conservative um, approach to policy. Interestingly, nearly everything the Trump administration has done so far 
has been by way of administrative action. Having chosen to begin his legislative program with the effort to repeal and replace Obamacare, Trump and the Republican Congress have run into serious opposition, not only from the Democrats, but also from an energized and enraged populace, legislators at both ends of the, political, of the Republican political spectrum, and now many of the nation's governors. Of course, in our present state of political polarization and gridlock, Obama felt compelled to govern by executive decree as well. As things stand today, it looks like the Senate bill to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act is dead. Died today with the uh, defection of, of two more uh, Republican senators. In which case, I think it's highly likely that Obama will get to Labor Day without having signed a single piece of significant legislation. I, I do that from time to time. And <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So with the, with the exception of the uh, confirmation of Neil Gorsuch, he really hasn't been able to get um, significant congressional action on anything. Because the health bills have consumed so much energy and attention, Congress has not moved any other significant legislation so far this year, including a hoped for major revision of the tax code and an infrastructure bill. Not to mention a whole raft of appropriations bills that must be passed to keep the government operating after September 30th of the end of, of the current fiscal year. It's hard to escape the conclusion that the Republican Party is having a very hard time transitioning from opposition, from the party of no to governing. In the case of health care, it's clear that much as they despised it, the Republicans, in fact, were never able to develop an alternative to Obamacare. The irony, of course, is that the ACA was modeled on the Massachusetts law passed under Mitt Romney that was itself patterned on a plan originally put forth by the Heritage Foundation. In my opinion, most Republicans never really despised the substance of the ACA. What they despised was the man who made it law and the way in which it was passed by the Democratic Congress of that time. Also, don't ever forget Mitch McConnell's words in the immediate aftermath of Obama's election to understand what this was all about. Our sole purpose is to make this a one-term president. Indeed, I can imagine that if Mitt Romney had won in 2012, something very much like the Massachusetts law would have become the law of the land. And it would have looked very much like the ACA, and we would be calling it Romney Care. I still think that when the dust settles, and that's going to take some time, that may still be what we wind up with. Uh, Mitch McConnell has said, um, first of all, he says he's, he's going to try to pass a, a, a straight out repeal. I don't think that will succeed for a variety of reasons. Uh, and thereafter, he has said, we will then be forced to sit down and work with our Democratic colleagues to see if we can't come up with something that's agreeable to both sides. That may wind up looking very much like uh, what Romney Care might have looked like, or what Obamacare might have looked like if it had been allowed to be implemented uh, as it was designed to do, but that's a whole other story. Okay, I'd like to turn now from Trump as leader of the party to Trump as the chief executive officer of the United States. Let's turn from him as titular leader of the party to CEO. How is his government functioning? In sh the short, and I think actually also the long answer to the question is not very well. His approval rating was the lowest of any president upon assuming office, around 40%, and it has only declined since then. It's now standing just north of 35%, which is the lowest of any president in history in the history of, of, of such polling uh, at this stage of, of, uh, of his administration, according to 
This is Sunday's uh, Washington Post ABC News poll. As of May 1st, 85% of the government's politically appointed positions remained unfilled. Although the pace has picked up since May 1st, as of July 10th, when I last checked, eight days ago, Trump had gotten 48 nominees confirmed. This compares with 200 by Obama on the same date, 196 for Bill Clinton on the same date, and 132 for George W. Bush. It's not clear whether this is by design or incompetence on the part of White House personnel. Of course, the Democrats in the Senate are certainly doing everything they can to delay the confirmation process, but that's an old story, and it's played by both parties, um, depending on who's in the opposition. Some think that the deconstruction of the administrative state means simply downsizing departments, letting them decay through what Daniel Patrick Moynihan might have called benign ne neglect, but which, if it's true, might more properly be called malignant neglect. In a recent piece in Politico.com, it suggested that the problem is more complicated than that. The Politico article suggests that cabinet secretaries and other department heads are having a very hard time getting people through the White House political vetting process. More than almost any previous president, this one poses a political loyalty test that many qualified candidates are either unwilling or unable to pass. As the administration's reputation continues to decline, fewer and fewer qualified people are even willing to be considered for senior government jobs, and I think they're having a devil of a time recruiting the kinds of people they'd really like to have in many of these administrative positions. The State Department is Exhibit A. There are hardly any positions requiring Senate confirmation. Nine out of 124, or 7%, have been filled. And that includes dozens of ambassadors who are waiting to be named and confirmed. As in many other departments across the government, the secretary has brought in a small group of close advisors who don't require Senate confirmation, with whom he attempts to manage the vast array of responsibilities uh, that the State Department has. EPA is another example, where the administrator, Scott Pruitt, so thoroughly distrusts career civil servants that he's managing the dismantling of environmental regulations by issuing directives which are not seen or reviewed by anyone outside of a close circle of advisors that he has brought in, um, many of them from the energy industry and many of them uh, energy industry lobbyists, and of course the White House itself. Donald Trump, who probably never expected to win the presidency and who has never held public office at any level, came into office unprepared to govern. He fired Chris Christie, who had headed up his transition team for a while, about midway through the transition process, and he never put in place the kind of team that could hit the ground running um, once the inauguration occurred. There's no semblance of leadership uh, in that regard. In addition to what an unkind person might call executive malfeasance uh, on the part of the Trump administration, Trump himself appears to have little interest in either the management of government or the substance of public policy. The man who, in the management of his own business empire, placed great emphasis on putting his name in large gold lettering on every property he built or acquired seems much more interested in self-promotion via Twitter and campaign-style rallies than in attending to the business of governing. One might argue, and some Trump loyalists do, that he has been so distracted by the Russia investigations and what he regards as media hostility that he's really not had time to focus fully on getting his administration up and running and putting forth a fully articulated legislative and policy agenda. But I suspect the problem goes deeper than that. Other incoming presidents have faced distractions, like the Whitewater affair in Clinton's case, or the birther nonsense, promulgated largely by Trump himself, uh, that confronted Obama. But which previous 
occupants of the Oval Office have surrounded themselves with a group of advisors so patently unqualified and uninformed about the ways of government. Actually, Jimmy Carter's Georgia Mafia comes to mind, but they at least had operated at the state level and, and in state government. What previous president brought his children and in-laws in and installed them in the, West, in the West Wing? And what previous presidents scheduled campaign-style rallies around the country instead of laying out their agendas and begin delivering on their campaign promises? Is it any surprise that a health care reform bill without presidential leadership encountered such rough sledding on Capitol Hill? or that a hastily cobbled together travel ban would be declared unconstitutional by a series of federal courts. The White House is in chaos. Uh, it's widely reported that there is enormous amount of backfighting and infighting going on uh, among Trump staff. It appears to be a, a totally dysfunctional uh, White House uh, at this stage. President Trump, both by his actions and his inactions, looks very much to me like an enormously gifted but amateur pop, uh, populist politician who thoroughly enjoys campaigning and working the crowds but detests toiling in the very swamp he promised to drain. He loves the trappings of power and the exercise of power but is deeply frustrated by the constraints imposed on him by our constitutional system including the institutions protected by the First Amendment. And he gives every indication of neither understanding nor caring very much about how government works and therefore about how one can manipulate the levers of power to get things done. When I see President Trump standing before an adoring crowd, his face lights up with a smile of pure pleasure. Yet his Washington visage presents a permanent scowl. Those facial expressions reveal a great deal, I think, about who Donald Trump is, and I fear tell us more than we'd like to know about what lies ahead. The Trump presidency is by almost universal assessment off to a very slow, halting start, and I've tried to identify at least a few of the factors that I think explain this. It's far too early to pass judgment on this presidency. It's only one-eighth over. But on the basis of what we have seen, it's hard to be optimistic no matter what one's political preferences might be. Now I want to turn to Trump as leader of the free world. A consequence of Trump's lack of understanding of the presidency that worries me more than any other is his systematic undermining of America's reputation around the world. The Pew Research Center recently released the results of an international survey into the comparative approval of Donald Trump and Barack Obama among the citizens of 11 countries. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, in only two of those countries, Russia and Israel, did Trump score higher than Obama? And in Israel, the difference was, was very small. In the other nine, Mexico, Sweden, Germany, France, Brazil, South Korea, Canada, Britain, and Japan. The approval of Trump ranged from a low of 7% in Mexico to a high of 22% in Japan. 22% as the highest among those nine countries. While Obama's approval levels ranged from a low of 50% in Mexico to a high of 93% in Sweden. The Swedes do love Obama. <laughs> the average gap between Obama and Trump is 63 percentage points, 63 percentage points, ranging from 83 points in Sweden to 54 points in Japan. This is just a sm one small window into our country's loss of prestige internationally. But if you put it together with an administration in which foreign policy is in a high degree of disarray, with an untutored presidential son-in-law in charge of vast areas of policy and a secretary of state who's been practically emasculated during his short time in office, there's real cause for alarm. The decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord was, in my opinion, a disaster. Not so much from an environmental perspective as from a political one. 
It has isolated the United States from much of the rest of the world. It has undermined our ability to lead in an area where our leadership has been crucial. And inevitably, it has weakened the entire structure of international cooperation on curbing greenhouse emissions and slowing global warming. And the decision did not come from the State Department or the foreign policy establishment. It came from Steve Bannon, Scott Pruitt, and the Koch brothers and other coal, oil, and gas interests here in the United States. At the recently concluded G20 summit in Hamburg, the US was utterly isolated when the other 19 nations, the richest and most powerful in the world, rededicated themselves to the principles and objectives of the Paris Accord. It was a moment of great international embarrassment, I think, for our country. And this kind of action on the part of the US can have real and lasting consequences. And here I'd like to just tell you a personal story um, about the importance of US leadership uh, on international um, policy questions. Uh, it, starting in the 1960s and the uh, Johnson administration and right straight through the 70s and into the early 80s, the United States led the globe on the international effort to control high rates of population growth. Uh, I was in the, uh, uh, the, the Agency for International Development, as, uh, as Gloria mentioned, and I was actually in charge of the global population effort uh, in, the, uh, er, in, the, in the, the early and, and mid-1980s. Um, the Reagan administration uh, in 1984 at a conference in Mexico City abruptly reversed the American position on international population and family planning work. Uh, we had, as I say, been the global leaders, both in terms of our voice, our power, our prestige, and the large amounts of money that we were putting into this effort. The Reagan administration, with one policy pronouncement, completely destroyed that leadership position of the United States. And real momentum that had built through the 1970s of international cooperation, from a period in the 60s when this was a highly controversial question, to the late 70s and early 80s when there was truly international agreement and, and collective action was, was severely undermined by this US action. Um, what the US does in these kinds of, uh, of international accords and agreements makes a very big difference. We still are the outsized 800-pound uh, gorilla uh, in so much uh, of international affairs. Uh, and I think that the withdrawal from the Paris Accord uh, makes the story I've just told pale in comparison. Uh, so it's, uh, th this, this is serious and significant stuff, I think. Unilateral withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership has effectively ceded Asian leadership to China. There surely were flaws in the agreement, particularly from the standpoint of American jobs. But wouldn't it have been better to reopen negotiations as, as Trump now has been persuaded to do in the case of the North American Free Trade Agreement than simply to pull out? Like the rush to repeal the Affordable Care Act, this was anti-Obama vindictiveness. I think not a responsible effort to make something better. As troubled as the world is and has been at many times over the years, the structure of peace and international cooperation built under American leadership following World War II has been an enormous success. The virtual monopoly on power enjoyed by the United States through the 1950s and 1960s inevitably has diminished as other nations have become more prosperous and more powerful, thanks in large part to American generosity and the structure of peace that we helped to create. But I believe the values of this country, the, the values that this country represents when we are at our best, are still the ones that hold the greatest hope for continued global peace and stability. And I worry deeply about the possible consequences that might follow from the leadership vacuum created by our retreat into an America first shell. I fear that Donald Trump's very peculiar vision of what making America great again means could very well end in precisely the opposite result. So let me conclude by going over a short list of things I think we can expect going forward. 
So much depends on how the Mueller investigation turns out uh, that it's really hard to predict what might follow. I think impeachment is a possibility. I think it's unlikely, uh, but I think that the findings of the Mueller investigation could turn out to be so damaging uh, that that would be uh, a possibility. That's number one. Number two, I expect Trump to clean house among his chief of staff and his communications team. I think he can not tolerate very much longer the kind of chaos that's going on in the White House, and I think he's got to do something about that. I don't think he's going to stop tweeting. <laughs> He'll get more deeply involved in the effort to pass tax reform, that is a major tax cut, uh, than he uh, than he was involved in, in health care reform. His heart was never in the health care issue. Um, and I think the uh, tax cut lies at the heart of his economic uh, interests and, and objectives. And he, I, su I suspect, will put the full weight of his office and his, his uh, popularity, such as it is, behind that effort. I think he'll make little or no headway on infrastructure, because I think the Republicans are not going to want to spend the money. Uh, even though Democrats are probably prepared to work with him on this one and have indicated uh, as much. He's surrounded by pretty good professionals on foreign policy, but he's quite unpredict unpredictable here. And I'm not at all sure what to expect on that front. Uh, and it's not, uh, be, be, and it is the area that worries me the most because foreign policy is where the president has the greatest leeway and is least constrained by Congress and the media. Trump is Trump, and the office has not changed him. It almost certainly won't going forward. So I expect the same thin-skinned narcissist to continue behaving as he has throughout his public life. And on that note, I thank you for your kind attention and would love to hear your comments. So we got a, a long time. We got about 50 minutes. We don't have to fill <laughs> the, the whole 50 minutes. And uh, I'm, while I'm certainly prepared to take questions, I would really love to hear your thoughts and comments on the subject of this uh, of this afternoon's talk. Yeah. One subject you did pick up on: How does he threaten the church in North Korea that he's going to take care of the Who does he think he's talking to? Yeah, wait, you're right. I didn't, I didn't talk about North Korea, and I really would be interested in what others in the audience, uh, how they would respond to, to your question, because to be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to your question. This is a, this is a real conundrum. I mean, Kim Jong-un is a highly unpredictable, probably highly unstable individual. Uh, and how one deals with uh, a person like that with nuclear capability uh, is a question, frankly, I, uh, uh, I don't uh, pretend to be able to, uh, to answer. But I would be delighted if somebody wanted to express some views on that. Not on that. Any, anybody want to talk about North Korea? Yeah. Um, we, need, we need a mic. I have, uh, There's a mic coming.
North Korea in a very, in a very special way, killing millions of people. Derek, you want to uh, have a word on that one? Uh, I think one has to bear in mind what Kim Jong-un is trying to achieve. He's trying to achieve survival of his regime. And one of the ways to guarantee that is to have a deterrent. Uh, and once he has been able to develop uh, a deterrent capability, either completely or almost, then that really, uh, if I may use the word, preempts any chance that I think the United States will launch a preemptive attack. Um, and because if in fact the, uh, the United States did, Seoul, the capital of uh, South Korea, is lying something like 40 kilometers, 35 kilometers, from the border. There are over 11,000 artillery and missiles uh, already within range. North Korea has those already. Uh, and uh, what would happen uh, would be uh, an absolutely horrendous uh, situation. So I personally think that uh, his aim, Kim Jong-un, he looked at the countries who uh, didn't develop a nuclear capability, Iraq, uh, 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 Libya, uh, uh, who got invaded, and he looked at the countries who have uh, developed one, or developed a breakout capability, uh, which has not been invaded, namely uh, Iran. Uh, and the conclusion he draw from that is that the best way to guarantee the survival of your regime is to develop a, a deterrent capability, not a threatened, a threatened capability, but a deterrent capability. And as I've often said before, um, nuclear weapons are militarily useless, but politically very valuable. Militarily useless, but politically very valuable. And I think it's that what he sees. I, I think in addition, I agree with what, De what Derek has said. I think that the likelihood of a, of a preemptive attack um, is, is very, very small. If, if there were ever going to have been one, it would have had to happen some time ago. Um, but I think in addition to what Derek has said, um, there's a very strong likelihood uh, that Trump would not be able to order um, such an attack and achieve it. I think the military leadership in the United States very likely um, would, would countermand such or ignore such an order. And that might very well be the trigger for the 25th Amendment um, because I think that every um, uh, well-informed, right-thinking uh, military strategist in the United States uh, would come to exactly the same conclusion that Derek has, has just articulated. So I think it's, a, it's highly unlikely, actually, uh, to happen. Yes? What I don't, I don't understand, um, why there are plenty of good-thinking Republicans, middle-level Republicans, that just have not turned on them. Have not, uh, other than Pete, Lindsey Graham, uh, for example, um, McCain. And there are many that I consider, you know, although I. I yeah. I did, did everybody hear the, uh, the, the comment? He said yeah. there, there are many moderate Republicans, middle of the road re Republicans, sensible Republicans, and I think you used that term, um, who have not turned on Trump, and he doesn't understand why not. Why have we, uh, why has he, has he uh, continued to, um, uh, to, uh, to be unchallenged uh, from within the, the Republican ranks? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's a question that's asked all the time because I am sure that there are many Republicans who opposed Trump's candidacy from the very beginning, who were, were utterly distressed by his success in, in winning the nomination, who have been agonizing uh, over, over, over that issue ever since he took office, and who, given his performance in office, uh, continue to be in, in a deep state of agony. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that that's the case. So the question is, why have they not turned on him, and what would it take uh, to, uh, to do so? There is some hope. Uh, my name is Elmer, and I come from New Jersey and have a home here in Manchester. 
Um, my mother first introduced me to Rodney Freeland Ice and Slumber back in 1952. Uh, Congressman Freeling Heisen is a Republican. He is from the 11th Congressional District in New Jersey. He also happens to be a cardinal. He is chair of the House Appropriations Committee. One of my recent positions was vice chair of legislative policy and strategy for the National Association of Railroad Passengers. We are 25,000 people in all 50 states that advocate for increasing rail service. When Donald Trump sent down his budget to, on transportation to the House, it basically gutted all of the FTA and Amtrak provisions. Freeling Heisen, again, is a chair. He, this last week, has managed to get the full House Appropriations Committee to agree to a $1.4 billion budget for Amtrak, which, while not great, is about the same as it was in fiscal year 2017. Fraley Heisen also originally opposed the House version of the health care bill, but under extreme pressure from Congressman Ryan, he had to switch his position. I was in Washington in late April. There was a demonstration in his office about 75 of his constituents that were there to support his decision not to support the Republican bill. So as the gentleman down here in the front said, yes, you know, beside Lindsey Graham and maybe behind, uh, rather than or in uh, deference to Senator McCain, there are other Republican moderates that when they have a wedge, they can go ahead and they can make a difference. The fact that Fruin Heiss has got this transportation appropriations bill approved by a Republican-dominated appropriations committee is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, thanks very much for that, uh, for that contribution. Uh, and I think um, uh, I, I would add a prediction to what you said. I, I think it's highly unlikely that the Trump budget um, will be enacted in anything like its current form. Uh, it is so at odds with where preponderant thinking in both houses of Congress is that I think the, the, the greatest likelihood is that we will end this fiscal year with a, with, a, with a continuing resolution that will carry right straight through the next year so that not only will the Amtrak appropriation be very close to what it is this year. I think most appropriations are going to turn out to be very close to what they have been in this fiscal year. Yeah, way in the back. I don't represent anybody except maybe some other people who think like me, but I think one of the major problems that we have, not even regarding the things that we've talked about, is the extreme polarization that we've had in the last number of years. Since when, in my memory, there has never been a time when we've named programs or bills after certain presidents. Obamacare? People don't even know if it's Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Well, how did this ever happen? Trump care? Who cares? I mean, it's really so ridiculous. It's gotten to the point where neighbor cannot speak to neighbor and friend cannot speak to friend, and we have to be very, very careful about what we say because it's called the other side now in Congress, not the Democrats or the Republicans. Do you listen to them on? I'm sure you do. It's called the other side wants this, the other side wants that. We don't have the great mediators now in our Congresses the way we used to have. And our leadership reflects down to people like us. But this Obamacare and Trump care, who names them? People don't even know what they have. Um, I think that, as we just discussed a minute ago, you, you might be surprised at others who know me might be surprised. I agree with 99.9% on everything that you said, which, um, you can't hear me? Is this better? Yes. Okay. Um, he said he agreed with 99.9% .9 of what I said. <laughs> and I used to be a very strong Republican. Um, on on a, a few points.
points I, I would like to make a comment. First of all, it's my theory that the reason that Congress has not done anything about health care despite their half-assed efforts to do so is that they really have not wanted to do it. They had seven years to put together a plan, both the House had it and the Senate, and they didn't do it. There must be a reason why. The reason that I think they finally made up uh, a it's almost hard to describe what they've done, it's, it's so embarrassing, is because, as I mentioned to you earlier, I think that Trump campaigned on the fact that the first thing he was going to do was get rid of Obamacare, and that uh, he would change it, and I don't think that there's been any feeling or desire within the Congress to really do anything about it, or they would have been working on it for seven years. I agree with you entirely about what you just said with respect to the military not allowing um, there to be a preemptive attack. I think that Mattis would be appalled if he had to take an order like that, and then I think he would refuse to do it, and it would probably raise a constitutional, a constitutional um, a problem because, of course, the military in this country has always said that it would be responsive to civilian control, and this would cause a great constitutional conundrum as to what might happen. But I, having spent many years in the military, I, I agree that I don't think that uh, they would do that. Um, I'll leave it at that. I have a couple of other ideas, but I'll, I'll let other people come. Is that good? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's I think good. it's all about tax cuts that the high up. That's what Obamacare is about. We want tax reform. That's what it is all about. And that is what they want to get through in this um, in this fiscal year, or this uh, 2017. But the whole name of the game is tax cuts at the IMF. Everybody hear that? Yep. OK, good. Yes, the gentleman right back there. I'd like you to fast forward to November of 2003 in terms of what your prognosticate the election results will be. And then you go back to today. When you're giving the same forecast in the polls that were given the last year, I think everyone was shocked. Now what do you think happens if, if, if we have an election tomorrow? Bear in mind, the very great book that was written in 2004, which was based, what's wrong with Kansas? Why do people in Kansas always vote against their own best interests? And I think what you might find out is surprisingly and very unfortunately that he might win again because people do vote in many ways against their own best interests. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. <laughs> um, I think that um, the Trump um, election in, uh, in 2016 um, was the result of a number of uh, unique factors in, in that year. Uh, one of them was the extraordinarily weak campaign uh, and, uh, and, and, and weak candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Uh, another was uh, uh, Trump's ability to tap into uh, a level of anger and resentment uh, that was underestimated uh, in the country at large. Um, and I think so many things can happen between now and 2020 uh, that to hazard a guess as to his uh, electability uh, four years hence uh, would be a fool's errand. Uh, so I won't fall for that trap. Um, I will say uh, that his um, already low level of popularity, and he, he is, despite his protestations to the contrary, a minority president, um, 
has, that, that his popularity has, has fallen further. Uh, there may be a rock solid 35% of the population that will stick with Trump no matter what. But that leaves 65% of the population uh, to go elsewhere. And if the Democrats uh, can, through the primary process, identify a viable, attractive candidate, uh, I think that Democrat would stand a very good chance. Now, on the basis of Trump's first six months, one has to uh, at least imagine uh, that his first term will be largely um, identified a failure, uh, at least in terms of legislative accomplishment, which f further weakens uh, the case for a Trump repeat. So while I'm not at all optimistic that the Democrats will find a standard bearer because right now it doesn't look very good and you know, one, one really wonders who that might be, um, the, our, our system has a way uh, of bringing people to the fore uh, that, uh, that, that surprise us uh, and, and, and whom we might, uh, we might least expect as witnessed the last victor. So I, um, I, I, th th this business about people voting against their self-interest, uh, yes, I mean, one has only to look uh, at the level of political sophistication as revealed in survey after survey after survey of what Americans actually know about our own history, about our political system, about how government works, uh, to realize that, um, uh, that, that, that for people to understand and act upon their self-interest in the voting booth uh, is, um, uh, is, is not easy. Um, that would be, I, I guess, uh, at, at least a partial response to a tough question. Tom? Why do people have such a hard time waiting for the microphone? <laughs> You just don't know where your self-interest lies. <laughs> Back to the North Korea question. I think Derek's analysis is correct. It, attacking North Korea doesn't make any sense uh, and is, is too dangerous. Uh, on the other hand, the wag the dog possibility if Trump's popularity continues to plummet and he seeks re-election, uh, I don't think is out of the question at all. And there are a number of far more, from his perspective, loathed countries that he could wage war against, Iran being one of them, uh, which doesn't have, as far as we know, any nuclear retaliatory capability. Uh, I would just pose that as a possibility and say and something interesting, that tr when Trump was elected, Everyone said he's unpredictable, but internationally he's been at least on war issues, not on, on opting out of the Paris courts, but on war issues. He's been almost predictably restrained, uh, gave the Russians advance notice on, on his response to the sound attacks, hasn't really escalated much other than sending more troops into Iraq, uh, but I think that's a possible danger area. Well, I, I agree. I mean, because the president is relatively unfettered in matters of, of foreign policy, there's always the risk that the president will do something uh, rash. Uh, but I think that Trump gives a very, very high level of deference to his military advisors. Um, he knows that it's an area he doesn't know. Uh, he may have views, but I, but I think, uh, at least so far, he appears to listen and to act on the advice that he's been receiving from the National Security Advisor from the Pentagon. I'm not so sure about the State Department, but, uh, but, but, but certainly on the military side, uh, I think that, uh, uh, that, that he's, he's, he's very much in, uh, in check. Axel. Steve, going on with the unpredictable uh, side of this presidency, <clears throat> I think you have stressed the deconstruction of the government, but he, had, on the other hand, has contributed to, con to construct <coughs> me, a dynamic 
among the civil society of this country. That has not been experienced in many, many years. And I think the future depends on all of us who, as part of that society, will defend the Constitution and will stand for the right things. And I think that's a side effect of Trump's unpredictability. That's a very, uh, a very good comment, and I'm, and I'm glad you made it. Because I was thinking um, that, that one of the things, I'm sorry, uh, he, he says that, that Trump's unpredictability um, has led to uh, a rise in activism on the part of civil society in the United States that we haven't seen for a very long time. Uh, and that he has great hopes that this civic activism um, uh, will, um, uh, will, will play a, a major constructive role going forward. Did I, did, did I say that right? And, I'm, and, I, and I said I was very glad that, that, uh, that Axel raised this point because um, it had been going through my own mind that I, that I wished in, in putting this together that I had spent more time talking about the reaction that Trump's policies has engendered. That, that in fact the, uh, the turnout at town meetings when congressmen have the courage to hold them, uh, the, uh, the, the numbers of telephone calls that people are making to Senate offices, uh, the uh, extent to which um, uh, people are showing up at rallies at state houses and in Washington. I mean, it really is unprecedented since, at least since Vietnam. Uh, and uh, I think that um, it, it is a, a perhaps um, a, uh, a sign of what we might expect in the political process in the midterm elections uh, and quite possibly beyond. I mean, there's always a question about how long this momentum can be sustained. Um, but um, the, the behavior of the president up to this point has sort of ensured that it would continue. Uh, and um, so I, I, I think there's a very good chance that, uh, that a, uh, an impassioned electorate or populace um, will continue to play an outsized role in, uh, in political affairs, thereby to a considerable extent constraining the freedom of action of individual members of Congress. Uh, I think, for example, that the congressman from Kansas who defected from the uh, McConnell bill was in some part the result of the enormous outpouring of public opinion that he encountered during a, the town meeting that he held over the July 4th recess, where 200 people showed up in a tiny little town in, in the middle of, of nowhere uh, to demonstrate their uh, opposition to the, um, to the repeal legislation and, and so on. So yes, I, I, I think your point is very well taken, uh, and, and I am optimistic. Uh, that, um, that the public expression of disagreement with much of what the Trump administration is trying to accomplish will um, prevent much of what he would like to do from actually happening. Mark, did you want to say something? I, I, no, no. Yes, Judy. Steve, as a long-time reproductive health professional, um, and actually attached to the last discussion of popular support and resistance against various proposals um, and legislative actions. What do you think the future of the family planning bill, Title X, of access to abortion, of access to reproductive health care is likely to be? And to what extent is it going to be a state-by-state -state issue, and how bad will that be? Yeah. Um, did everybody hear that question? Yes, no? <laughs> um, she asked, um, what's likely to be the future, uh, both at the national level and at the state level, of the attacks on uh, sexual and reproductive health, family planning, birth control, Planned Parenthood. Um, and, <clears throat> okay, um, 
getting down a little bit into the weeds on this one, but uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm happy to go there. Uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, the defunding of Planned Parenthood would have happened had the McConnell bill been approved, uh, and, as well as the House bill. That isn't going to happen, so the federal funding for Planned Parenthood remains intact as long as the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land and, the, and current appropriations uh, are uh, as they are. Um, and th that's most important because of Planned Parenthood eligibility as a Medicaid provider. Uh, most of the, of the federal money that Planned Parenthood receives is through Medicaid reimbursements. Um, there's also something called Title X, uh, which is the much smaller amount of money that the federal government provides to Planned Parenthood and other providers around the country to subsidize uh, or provide free contraception uh, in, uh, in clinics around the country to predominantly low-income women. Um, there, there's much greater vulnerability at the federal level. The uh, uh, Secretary Price has named as head of the Office of Population Affairs and, and also to another senior position in um, HHS, uh, two militantly anti-abortion, anti-family planning activists. I mean, people who were selected precisely to dismantle the programs they nominally are responsible for administering in much the same way that Scott Pruitt was named for that purpose uh, at EPA. I mean, this, is, this, is, this was a hostile act on the part of the administration to dismantle family planning or to, or to dismantle uh, Planned Parenthood to the greatest extent possible. And I think they're going uh, tooth and nail after Title X. So I think Title X is in, is in real jeopardy unless Congress is prepared to fight back on that. And a Republican Congress probably isn't, uh, at least not very much. Um, at the state level, uh, that's where most of the action is. And state after state has, impo has Im been imposing on Planned Parenthood restrictions that, that severely cut back its ability to provide services. Um, and uh, it, it, all of the red states uh, are in the process of passing increasingly restrictive legislation that's hard to reach except through um, court action. Uh, in a number of, uh, of states and in a number of cases, courts have found these actions at the state level to be unconstitutional. Uh, and so some of the worst of what Texas, for example, has tried to do, or Iowa, uh, has been overturned by, uh, by judicial action. Uh, but there's no question that this administration is filled with people absolutely committed to the Republican platform commitment uh, to defund Planned Parenthood and put it out of business. So as long as Trump is in office and the Republicans control both houses of Congress, uh, Planned Parenthood will be in deep jeopardy. Which, by the way, is why all of you should continue to support Planned Parenthood. <laughs> well, maybe they should just raise all the children that are born. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that, that's vindictive. It would be, uh, it, it would be better, it would be better if, if uh, unwanted pregnancies really uh, could be prevented. Yes, Larry. Steve, I appreciate your optimism about all the demonstrations, et cetera, but his following is rock solid, isn't it? It's based. Yeah, but there's a lot more people who are opposed to him than, than are for him, so it becomes a question of the intensity of the resistance versus the intensity of his support. And I don't know how that's going to play out. I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, this rise of the alt right and how afraid or how fearful we should be of what I consider propaganda coming from Trump. Um, I'm just going to make a quick comment. My dad was a German soldier. He passed away last year at 97, immigrated here. He said, Propaganda is the same, the names have just changed. So I thought that was a really interesting comment. Um, so I just wanted to get your view on yeah, that. Well, uh, I, I would invite others to, uh, to, to chime in on that. I, uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on the alt right. Um, am I scared uh, of what we're seeing coming from the alt right? 
Uh, am I scared by the fact that a leading spokesperson for the alt-right is in the most senior advisory position in the White House? You bet I am. Uh, I think that um, the, the, the danger of a fascistic movement gaining real strength in this country has not been as high since the 1930s as it is right now, May, maybe during the height of McCarthyism. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know. But um, on the other hand, my fear of this is much less now than it was six months ago. Um, and I can't exactly tell you why, except that, uh, first of all, they, you know, much of this activism has been identified. Uh, and many of, of its leaders are under surveillance. Uh, and. Uh, I, I do think that um, our internal security apparatus uh, is very much attuned to the most dangerous, at, at least in terms of, of violent behavior, uh, of, of the, of the alt-right. Um, but the fact that Donald Trump uh, a, reads Breitbart News and brings into the White House the head of Breitbart News uh, an explicitly racist, anti-Semitic um, uh, movement is, is, is extremely discouraging, if, if, if not terrifying. Uh, and so am I, do I continue to be worried? Do I think that we need to continue to be highly vigilant? Absolutely. Uh, am I concerned that the alt-right uh, is going to gain a real political foothold? Uh, in this country, uh, beyond what it already has within the Republican Party, um, I'm, I'm, I'm less terrified uh, about that. But I would invite others. Uh, yes, Marjorie, do you want to say something on this? Yeah, um, I'm definitely afraid of the all right. I think that Bannon is terrible. I do think that the far left is also very dangerous. And I think the Democratic Party has gone very far to the left. And they have a platform that had anti Semitism in it, as well as the far right. So I don't think that you can just say the alt right um, without looking at the far left, which has become a very strong voice in the Democratic Party. It's not the Democratic Party of our parents or our grandparents, it's not the Republican Party. That's the problem. We cannot. Where are the moderates? Where have all the wonderful moderates gone? The Scoop Jacksons, the Mike Mansfields, where are those people? They're not there anymore. And so I'm just as worried about the far left as I am about the far right. There's a gentleman here who I think might want to comment on that. No? <laughs> oh, oh, you bear the moderates, he raised his hand. Um, is there somebody who'd like to respond to what, uh, what was, was just said? Is there, do you agree with that statement? That the that the far left is as worrisome from as as, as the far right. One gentleman here says there is no far left. <laughs> yeah. Cole, I've been waiting to hear from you. <laughs> I have a very big concern. We've talked about North Korea. We've talked about threats to America. Donald Trump has called for transparency on the wall to Mexico because of the fear of 60 pound bags of drugs being thrown over the wall that could potentially hurt Americans. And I wonder if we could get your, uh, your assessment of the threat to the average American from those bags of drugs flying over the wall. More importantly, he did say that. And the issue is a different one. I and mean, it's wonderful this has been serious. But we haven't talked about the crazy things he says that seem to go, some of them go into policy, or not policy, but into forward action. Um, like the, um, the, uh, the concerns about election uh, engineering that, that caused him to lose the popular vote. And now uh, the state being asked to turn over documents. Um, I, I'd like to have your thoughts on some of the crazy statements that uh, he's made and some of the, the things that have happened from him. I think they're crazy. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I don't know what I, don't know what I can add to, to what you said. I, I, I do think that this electoral commission, this bogus issue that he's asked this electoral commission to investigate, uh, is, is just a terrible distraction and misuse of resources. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, but the fact that it exists uh, is, um, you know, is, is just, just really discouraging. As far as the wall is concerned, um, I don't know what kind of wall eventually, he, he's, he's got to do something, I suppose, but we, we know already that it's not going to be all the way across. Um, it's, it's only going to be a partial wall. Uh, and we know that Mexico's not going to pay for it. And we know that he's having a hell of a time finding appropriations to pay for it. Uh, so I think that um, you know it might, there might be a picket fence in, <laughs> in a few places, but I, but I don't think we're going to you know going to see that. And of course, that was the first one. That was the first big ridiculous statement that that he and 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 once he makes one of these statements, he never backs off. And, 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 and that's discouraging. I, I mean, a, a president who can't um, not only admit when he's done something foolish, uh, but doubles down uh, on, in his determination to show himself to be, to be right. I think the Electoral Commission is all about that. You know, he made a statement that he had won by three million, or, or that you know, there were three million people who voted uh, that fraudulently, and you know, having said it now, he's got to. He, he feels as if he's got to follow through on that. So yes, I mean, I, I think it's crazy. I mean, uh, but I promised that I was not going to get into an assessment of T Donald Trump's mental state, be because because I'm not qualified to do that. Lenore. I was interested that you reminded us that uh, he trusts his military experts. And, and then it ties into a comment that somebody made about people voting against their interests. Because I think they don't believe experts. Um, we're a whole country of voters who distrust people who know it. That was part of Hillary's problem. That was one reason that W got elected because he acted. He see, turns out he knew stuff, but he pretended not to know stuff. He pretended that if we elect him, we'd be electing somebody just like us. And Trump took it as low as it could go for not knowing anything. And and yet you remind us he trusts his military experts. And I'm thinking that. The rest of the country is so inexpert on military matters that they're, they have no opinion about distrusting experts on that issue. But if, if you think of all the U.S. where the moderates went, where did the people who know stuff go? They don't, you know, they, <laughs> they're not advising anybody. And they, oh, Obama, yeah, he was black, so that was bad, but also he was smart. And he acted smart. He was too smart for us. He used big words. But where is that going to go? How is, are we ever going to see it? Is it here forever? <laughs> um, your husband wants to answer that question. <laughs> he only is an expert on certain parts of the country, certain times of history. Our first time. Um, so, I know. <laughs> but let me see if I can um, throw a challenge for you to, to respond. Um, and for that purpose, I'm going to join um, two subjects. One is the budget, and the other one is the Department of State. If you look at the outlines of the budget, the federal budget, that the OMB Director Mulvaney has proposed, you will see the summary of the Heritage Foundation's Blueprint for America, which is the title of the budget outline that the White House submitted, Blueprint for America. It's available in the Heritage Foundation, and it's, um, it's a great read, especially if it's rainy, but it is a great read, and it's there. 
in the budget. Which means that Mulvaney and company, whatever you may think of the budget proposal, has a vision. Fair? In the the case, Heritage Foundation is a vision. That's correct. Yeah. And he himself is a, an acolyte of that organization. If you look to the Department of State by contrast, and I speak partly informed by one of our children, who is another esteemed uh, laborer in the United States Agency for International Development. The initial semi-enthusiasm for the Secretary of State Tillerson has largely evaporated. Why? And it's largely because no one really knows, or even intuits, what the vision is for the arm of American diplomatic relations. So, at least my sense is that the unholy trinity of Mattis, um, McMaster, and Tillerson is now one less. Because Mr. Tillerson is reportedly more interested in managing, and I mean that from a from a CEO perspective, in management than it is with advancement. Advancement of a vision, implementation of the mission of the Department of State and all its different years. Did everybody hear the, 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 the comment? Uh, basically. Are the and not be <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't even dream of trying to uh, summarize what you said. Uh, the, the, the great mystery for me is how Rex Tillerson, having been named Secretary of State after a really long period of vetting and, and of, of, of other potential candidates and long conversations with Trump, could accept a 31% slashing of his budget. I just, you know, you come into Secretary of State and the first thing that happens is the President sends up a budget that cuts your department by 31%. A 31% cut in the State Department, uh, or as it's known, the, basically the, uh, the foreign affairs budget, um, not only decimates the foreign aid program, it also decimates our diplomatic presence. It, it, it means the closing of dozens of embassies, uh, the curtailment of, uh, of, of, of the projection uh, of American uh, presence uh, around the world, and how a self-respecting Secretary of State could could accept that with 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 not even a whimper. I, I just absolutely can't understand. How can a self-respecting man of of his stature and accomplishment uh, sit in that seat and 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 allow the department he was just confirmed to to lead be be absolutely destroyed? Uh, it, it's beyond me, unless he knows what I know, but the president doesn't know, which is that budget isn't going anywhere. I mean, it, it, I, I think it's highly likely uh, that the, uh, that the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and both Foreign Appropriations Committees will simply not allow that to happen. Uh, and, and Tillerson probably knows that it's not going to happen. Um, but still, I mean, it's a statement of priorities. It's a statement of presidential intention that, as Secretary of State, you can't ignore. Uh, and so I, while, while Tillerson's behavior is to me a, a, a tremendous mystery, um, uh, I, I think, in fact, the State Department will survive. Stan? I think one of the biggest problems that we're going to have, or we may have, is we're going along with a stock market which is up 20% roughly since the election. Um, unemployment, which has stayed low and flat. Revenues, which are rising slightly. Uh, the fact that no uh, health care bill may be either repealed or passed. So status quo keeps going is that all of these things just float along and we get to an election in 2018 and 2020 where half the population doesn't vote again, or close to half, especially in a midterm election. And that's how we 
these things just continue by their own inertia. People just don't come out to vote. They, you know, they didn't, well, it's not as bad as it could have been, so why bother? I think that's, uh, that's a realist's uh, assessment of, of, of the way things might go for the next, over the next year and, be, and, and beyond. Um, I'm hoping that Axel is right, uh, that there is so much um, uh, fervor um, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the anti-Trump world uh, that the midterm turnout will turn out to be very different from what we're accustomed to. It's not going to be 35%. It may, it may be closer to 50%. And, and that, would make, that, that could make a, big, a very big difference. I, are we uh, at the witching hour? One more question. You waited till the very end, didn't you? <laughs> well, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, before we take too much satisfaction as a group here in the fact that the Republican effort to replace Obamacare has failed, we are focusing on six months or a year, four years, but if you look out 10 years, medical costs in Medicaid and Medicare are taking all of the budget, the federal budget, and leading to no discretionary spending whatsoever unless the changes are made. And we see the same sort of phenomenon in disability payments in their social security, very fast growth. So we take comfort in the short run here in this room, but I think there's a longer term problem in medical care costs both in the government and as a nation, that we have not begun to tackle. And you could argue that that is driving some of the Republican effort, quite apart from getting rid of Obamacare. The only other point I want to make is that we take, I don't know, maybe perverse delight in the fact that coal miners are so silly as to expect their jobs to come back because Trump promised them. But investors seem to me equally to believe that trees grow to the sky in terms of the stock market and that this is seen as a vote of confidence in this administration to highs record levels of the stock market, which I think gives pause. Well, two very good comments on which to, to end. Bruce, I'm, I'm very glad that you uh, you brought up the, 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 the continuing um, threat of rising health care costs and the imperative to, uh, to address that effectively. I, I'm not an optimist uh, at all on, on this, but it seems to me that the, that the weaknesses that have become apparent in, in the Affordable Care Act um, and the failure of the Republicans to produce a, a fair alternative um, sets the stage for the possibility uh, of a serious bipartisan effort to address um, not only the insurance side, but the cost side uh, of that equation. And they do have to be tackled simultaneously. Uh, the Democrats apparently are seeing the building of a single payer wave. And uh, I'm hearing more and more of that uh, over the last few weeks. Um, and it, it, it's an interesting question. If, 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 the Demo if that becomes uh, a rallying cry uh, within the Democratic Party, what's that going to lead to in terms of the possibility of a, of a bipartisan um, solution to, to the, to the health care conundrum? <clears throat> so thanks for that comment. Thank you all. You've been a great audience. Thank you.